Okay, welcome, welcome back. Uh, this is uh, where we get to hand over and uh, hand over to our, our traditional handover for the incoming president uh, for 2011-12, who is uh, David Ng. So. I would uh, like to thank you all for your support this year and invite David to come forward to give his uh, incoming presidential address. Welcome, David. Thanks, Jennifer. Um, for those who, uh, I know we don't have internet access in this room, so you, you might find it difficult to check, but the web pages on the ISSS site have changed. So on the front page, we have announced uh, ISSS San Jose 2012, um, and uh, we have announced the uh, first set of plenary speakers, um, which is a, a great advance. Uh, I'll come back to talk to you about that. Uh, and I'll, I'll talk, part, part of this talk will be to help you understand why uh, we're going this direction and, uh, and what I would like to see the society to do over the next year as we prepare for that. Um, I have also, uh, on the website, uh, created the link so the presidential address slides are already there and uh, you will find, uh, for those of you who have actually seen the way that I do teaching, there is a long list of references which I will not cover. Uh, they are there so that uh, when you don't know what it is, um, you can look it up. And, and that's part of what um, I, I'd like to do is, uh, is, is bring more knowledge into the organization. As we look forward in 2012, I encourage members of the ISSS to continue in development of the sciences of synthesis. Synthesis means putting things together rather than taking things apart. Synthesis leads to emergence, properties of the whole that are not in the parts. The research communities centered on service systems and on natural systems I see will benefit through a synthesis of a systems approach. So this address has six parts. First thing I want to talk about the challenges where the systems approach can make a contribution. I want to explain a little bit about the idea of service systems and discuss the research in the service systems. Discuss the research in the natural systems, uh, in particular the ecosystems uh, where I think there's an opportunity. And then discuss some frames brought with the systems approach. Uh, this is where the reading list will come in. Uh, I'm going to present some frames for thinking about systems and I expect that there will be very few people in this room that will be familiar with the whole list. Um, we've had some discussions over the years about the system movement moving forward, and this is one of those times where I think we have that opportunity. I'll talk a little bit about learning and knowing and how we'll do that in ISSS 2012 in San Jose, uh, and then I'll conclude with the call for participation at the annual meeting. Where is the systems approach valuable? Let's think about this in three parts. Firstly, there's this question about complexity in the 21st century. Secondly, we'll talk about the heritage of the system movement, where we've been. And finally, let's talk about a future for the systems movement. Now, this is a future. This is not the future. So although I am setting the theme, um, uh, I, I expect that we'll get a lot of sweeping in of new content. To me, the value of the systems approach is associated with its functions to appreciate the connections across a variety of systems and to surface blind spots in our views of the world. I'm going to turn and I'm going to play a few moments out of uh, the 2011 World Economic Forum. Uh, the world from the perspective of both the average citizen and world leaders uh, seems to think that the world is complex. Thank you. 
is so many complex challenges at the same time. And so all of the annual meeting in Davos is not just to address one of those challenges, but to provide a systemic, strategic overview about all what's important on the global agenda, and if possible, to come up with solutions and how we should confront as a multi-stakeholder community those challenges. To name only some of the challenges, of course, it's the economic situation, it's uh, the great volatility which we have, not only in the capital markets, but uh, food prices, commodity prices in general, and I could go on and on our risk report, which we will uh, publish um, uh, just in time for the annual meeting, will describe in detail 34 of those challenges. In 2011, the World Economic Forum has identified risk in five domains. Economic risks, geopolitical risks, environmental risks, societal risks, and technological risks. These risks are all depicted as in a landscape that, depict, that depicts the perceived likelihood to occur in the next 10 years and the perceived impact in billions of dollars US. We can't, however, divide and conquer. These risks are all interconnected. Watch this nifty shift they have here. Sometimes it's nice to have money to do your graphics for you. So. Uh, this is a problematique in the era of rapid technological progress and social change. Let me give you another perspective on this. Our modern world is estimated as a $64 trillion complex, dynamic, and interconnected system of systems with the large core systems being, firstly, infrastructure at $22 trillion, leisure, recreation, and clothing, this is interesting, second, $7.8 trillion, transportation at $6.9 trillion, government and safety at $5 trillion, and food at $4.8 trillion. An estimated 15 trillion is waste and loss through inefficiency in silos, of which it's estimated that 4 billion could be, could be eliminated. The largest percentage inefficiencies in the silos um, are firstly in healthcare, secondly education, thirdly government and safety, fourthly building and transportation infrastructure, and fifthly the electrical grid. Is it true that we've never faced this much complexity before? How might we, as scientists and citizens of the world, become part of the solutions as opposed to remaining as part of the problem? The heritage of the system movement goes back into the 1954s at the founding of the International Society of System Sciences in 1954. Uh, this is from, uh, from Deborah's book. Early in the fall of 1954, four of the distinguished CABS, CASBS, Center for Advanced Studies in Behavioral Science Fellows, Bertolanti, Bolding, Gerard, and Rappaport, sat together at lunch discussing their mutual interest in theoretical frameworks relevant to the study of different types of systems, including physical, technological, biological, social, and symbolic systems. According to Bolding, someone suggested they form a society to foster the interdisciplinary research on a general system, general theory of complex systems, and thus the idea for the Society for General Systems Research was born. The systems movement has a foundation in science that sweeps in many related perspectives, and so when people ask what systems thinking, people ask what it is we do here. Um, this is interesting, uh, I no normally don't teach, and so when I get into that teaching, it's like I realized I didn't have an answer. So I will provide as an aid for people who do not have an answer, a perspective of systems uh, in many ways. And I'm going to focus on, uh, on four um, systems words or system phrases. Mm -hmm. Systems thinking, 
systems engineering, systems practice, and system science. Systems thinking, in Checkland's definition, is the epistemology which, when applied to human activity, is based upon the four basic ideas. Emergence, hierarchy, communication, and control as characteristics of systems. When applied to natural or design systems, the crucial characteristic is the emergent properties of the whole. I have the page number in the references for people who want to do that. Practically, uh, I found that Russ Acoff's definition is quite helpful. Systems thinking as a style can be contrasted with the order of analysis and synthesis. In systems thinking, synthesis precedes analysis. Firstly, identify a containing whole system of which the thing to be explained is a part. Secondly, explain the behavior or property of the containing whole. Then thirdly, explain the behavior or property of the thing to be explained in terms of its role or function within the containing whole. So when someone, and I, have, I, I expect that all of you have encountered people who claim to be systems thinkers and then you're having a conversation over wine and you're thinking, man, this is the most reductive systems thinker I've ever met. <laughs> uh, it is helpful actually to use Acoff's definition because firstly, looking for the containing whole is that interesting proposition. And then the second, the behavior property of the containing whole is always the part that I find interesting. Getting to that part to be explained and maintaining that perspective on the containing whole is what I find the reductive people miss. They are thinking systems, they're just not thinking the containing whole. We've recently joined with INCOSI, uh, the International Council on Systems Engineering. So I've been actually looking at, uh, at what system engineering means. Um, I had the benefit of being at the INCOSI International Symposium in Denver, and so I asked some of the people, and um, they don't like their definition, definition either. So uh, the best definition, definition that they gave was, well, we actually go back to Hall in 1954. Uh, systems engineering enables science to have an impact with progress through organized creative technology. Systems engineering attempts to shorten the time lags between scientific discoveries and their applications, and between the appearance of human needs and the production of new systems to satisfy those needs. Systems engineering considers the, the content of the reservoir of new knowledge. So systems engineering is also supposed to be looking forward then plans and participates in the actions of projects and whole programs of projects leading to applications. It considers the needs of its customers and determines how these can be best met in the light of all knowledge, both old and new. Thus, systems engineering operates in the space between research and business and assumes the attitudes of both. Now, what I had said about systems thinkers, I think that system engineering is also facing their challenges with reductionism. So um, I, I, uh, I enjoyed reading this and finding this reference and finding that, that system engineering in discussing doing the thing right, this seems to suggest that as far back as 1954, it is more than that. However, the way that the average layman, the average practicing <coughs> systems engineer may be doing that may or may not be any worse than the people who claim to be systems thinkers. Let's go to a systems practice. Systems practice sets a scope of human activity systems. The idea of systems practice implies a desire to find out how to use systems concepts in trying to solve problems. A problem solving, a possible approach to systems practice aimed at real world problem solving can be tackled by identifying, designing, and implementing human activity systems. So while we've been talking about systems thinking as thinking, systems practice is very much more about doing and having the impact from the human activity system. Which brings us to system science. System science uh, brings us a general systems theory and we can go back to Boldy. The objectives of general systems theory can be set out with varying degrees of ambition and confidence. At a low level of ambition, but with a high degree of confidence, it aims to point out similarities in the theoretical constructions of different disciplines where they exist, 
and to develop theoretical models having applicability to at least two different fields of study. So at that low level ambition, we should be doing at least that. Let's try for the higher level of ambition. At the higher level of ambition, but per with perhaps a lower degree of confidence, so uh, this is when we are doing real research, it hopes to develop something more like a spectrum of theories. A system of systems. Now this is interesting. I thought systems of systems was something that came from the systems engineering community of Boulding said it in 1956. Um, a system of systems which may perform the functions of a gestalt in theoretical construction. Such gestalt in special fields have been of great value in directing research towards the gaps they reveal. Thus, the research in the system sciences has a unique function to assist disciplinary sciences with gaps that they themselves may or may not appreciate. Let's talk about what we might do uh, in the future. And um, I'll refer to Bateson in the five level categorization. And when I was reading this more closely, uh, I came to appreciate that learning is process. Just to be clear, as uh, for people who uh, happen to need the extra homework, um, uh, structure, as I've learned it, is arrangement in space, and process is arrangement in time. The systems movement has the benefit of a long tradition of learning. In the five-level categorization by Bateson, we have zero learning, which is characterized by a specificity of response, which, right or wrong, is not subject to correction. Learning one is change in specificity of response by correction of errors and the choice within a set of alternatives. Learning two is a change in the process of learning one. It's a corrective change in the set of alternatives from which choices are made, or it's a change in how the sequence of the experience is punctuated. Learning three is a change in the process of learning two, a corrective change in the sy system of sets of alternatives from which choices are made. We shall later see that this level, that, that this um, is at the level where some human beings may not, may or may not be able to do this, and we can start debating about whether animals can or can't do that. Learning four would be a change in le learning three, but probably does not occur in any living organization in the earth. We're now talking about evolutionary process, and so we may not be smart enough to understand this as human beings. It does not mean that the earth doesn't learn. In thinking about the system sciences and how we can help people to learn, um, I'm going to lean on the curriculum of medical ignorance at the University of Arizona College of Medicine. The idea that they had at the College of Medicine is that when a doctor comes and asks you, uh, when a doctor comes and gives you a hard diagnosis, like you've got cancer, the first response needs to, for the doctor to be, uh, the, fir the first question from the patient comes, are you sure? And the answer the doctor has to give is, yes, I'm sure, because having ambiguity only makes the patient feel worse. However, in the College of Medical Ignorance, they need to make doctors, while they're still in school, appreciate that medical, medical knowledge does not have all of the answers. In the same way that we were talking about Bateson's fourth, uh, le uh, learning four, there are things that we may not know. So we can approach this uh, through a back of ignorance. There are known unknowns. All the things that you know, you don't know. Known unknowns are great things. Because if you know you don't know, you can do research. We have passive ignorance, sorry. Uh, we have passive ignorance, which is, we could talk about as the ignore, ignoring. And these are errors, which are things that we think that we know, but we don't. And we have unknown knowns. All the things that you know that you don't know, you know. Now, unknown knowns are related to competence. So all of you, uh, I don't know when the last time you were swimming, but if you took swimming lessons when you were 10 years old and someone threw you in the water, you might have a chance of survival. If you have to teach someone to swim, that's a bit of a challenge. It is one of those unknown knowns. You don't think about it, but you know how to do that. Errors are interesting because how do you know that you have an error? The only way that you can know you have an error is if you speak to someone else and they point it out to you. 
Now, this is an interesting social issue because in order to learn, you have to have errors. So in Silicon Valley, they have uh, models like uh, fail fast, um, those sorts of learnings. But admitting your errors is uh, an interesting challenge to maturity because people have to say, thank you for telling me I was wrong. Now, at this meeting, we have a, a maybe part of the reason that this community binds together is that we seem to appreciate our errors. And we come here and we actually believe, I hope most of us believe, that we don't know everything. And when someone points out an error, it's like, I hadn't thought about that. There's more areas. There is the unknown unknowns. Things that we don't know, we don't, that, that we don't know, we don't know. Here, I believe system science has a great opportunity to contribute because we don't know what we don't know. If we knew what we didn't know, we would do research. We could send engineers, particularly systems engineers, and say, this is what I need done. Fix it for me. However, we're in a situation now where we have unknown unknowns. We're dealing with those issues from, that I described before, uh, the $4 trillion problem we have, the World Economic Forum, and they're interconnected. They are a mess. They are a problematic. How do we fix that? Don't know. We don't know the method. So we, we have an opportunity here, particularly with the system scientists, and we should maintain the opportunity to embrace the unknown unknown. There's two more areas which are active ignorance, which are the ignored. These are taboos and denials. Taboos are things that are dangerous, polluting, or forbidden knowledge. And denials are those things that are so painful to know that you don't. My favorite example and, uh, and dilemma, um, in Canada, uh, we, we have uh, traditional Chinese medicine. And so we've had this discussion about do we regulate traditional Chinese medicine or not? So if Western medicine regulates traditional Chinese medicine, that says that they have, in effect, blessed traditional Chinese medicine, which not all the doctors want to do. So that's somewhere between a denial and a taboo. So, okay, so you, don't, so you don't like them doing traditional Chinese medicine, so we'll regulate them. But if we regulate them, then we have to actually know what they're doing. So we run into these sorts of loops. In, in the system sciences, uh, we may or may not deal with so much with the taboos or, or uh, denials, but we need to recognize that those are there. In addition to the heritage community that we've been looking at in the system science community, there are two communities of re research and practitioners who are on convergent paths, in my opinion. There's a group associated with the emerging field of service science, management, engineering, and design, and a second one that's a group associated with resilient science and sustainability, which I have shortcut for the layman as natural science. I'm going to talk about that in three parts, and, and part of this is to, to give you some insight into why I've chosen the theme of service systems, natural system, systems for the meeting next year. So firstly, I'm going to talk about forms of service systems and challenges. I'm going to talk about some of the ideas that have come from the system sciences um, with the co-production of outcomes and interactive value. And uh, I'm going to also talk about the, some new technologies about the unobservable becoming observable. So we have this question about what do we mean by service systems? Jim Sporer, who has been uh, a leader in in, uh, in this and came to the ISSS meeting in 2005 in Cancun when he was starting the service science research um, has created this categorization of service systems. So what is a service system? Uh, at a high level, let's talk, they're, they're, they have first category which is systems that move, store, harvest, and process. The second are systems that enable healthy, wealthy, and wise people and the third are systems that govern. Looking at these, the type of, in the first category that we're talking about, are transportation systems. Transportation systems are service systems. 
And so as Acoff uh, would describe when we talk about buses going around people um, not on them, we start describing the function to human civilizations. A, a bus that goes around with nobody on it is not, it, it is a system, but it doesn't serve anybody. So if we talk about transportation as a service system, um, it changes the light. Now, um, in Toronto, we have a lot of questions about, um, about the Toronto Transit Commission and the subways and this sort of thing, and, and whether people serve or don't get served. So you run it quickly, rapidly into it is a system that operates, but whether it is a system that serves is a different question. Water and waste management. And people tend to focus on the product of water and having pipes, but the question is, does the water serve the people that live there? Food and global supply chains. Again, there's been so much emphasis on the product, but let's think about our people being nourished properly. Energy and the energy grid. So you seem to be running into a lot of constraints there. And information and communication technology is one of the more advanced ones. Now down the uh, right column, I have um, Jim Spore's categorization. I blogged about this. He actually hasn't published it. So uh, he was working, uh, he published the list but he had been working with uh, uh, the National Science Foundation, other organizations. And so the reason they're in this order is that Jim has proposed that when we are learning about service systems, we should take on a mini project within our schools. So in kindergarten, the children can understand transportation systems. Take the children in kindergarten to the bus depot. Show them the buses get repaired, how they get scheduled, all those sorts of things. They will understand and appreciate those sorts of things. By grade four, and this is an interesting statement, they should be able to understand information and communication technologies. Um, and so uh, when, I, when I first came, first went to Finland and I just understood that they don't have uh, so many phones, but I saw the, the mobile phone lined up, one for Petri, one for, one for Mina, and one for Tommy. It's like, oh, okay, children have mobile phones. They can understand and appreciate information and communication technologies. So from there, from, we go to grade five, and we talk about systems that enable wealth, healthy, wealthy, and wise people. Building and construction. Building and construction is a service system. Now we also have criticism here of architects who build buildings for themselves as opposed to building for the people to occupy. So uh, we have a discussion about, uh, about uh, service and how construction serves into that. Banking and finance. Retail and hospitality. By the time you get to grade eight, uh, you should get into healthcare. Take your kid to the hospital. Uh, find out how the healthcare system operates. Uh, and then grade nine, education, including universities. By grade nine, they may consider what it is that they're actually, why they're in school. But this is the point at which they don't want to be there, so they might want to learn about the, uh, the service that education provides. In the last category, Jim proposes that systems that govern, firstly starting with the government of cities, which people actually think are pretty tough to understand, and then moving up there from regions and to regions of states and then to nations. And so here we have something like a skeleton for the service, service systems that we're looking at. There's a formal definition that's come out in the uh, so-called Cambridge report uh, that was done jointly by IBM and the Institute for Manufacturing. And, um, and here are the, here's the definition where a service system can be defined as a dynamic configuration of resources. And those resources are people, technology, organization, and shared information that creates and delivers value between the provider and the customer through service. Now here's some more of the, of the uh, learning by teaching. Um, when I was in Finland in February, uh, the first module was on service systems. And in the, in the fall, the students had struggled a lot with systems. When I said phrase it as a service system, things got a whole lot clearer because you start talking about stakeholders, you start talking about customers, you start talking about people who are outside the system that receive those services. So it's been an interesting adjustment as we've been talking about this to make that movement from thinking about systems to thinking about service systems. Systems, there are a lot of systems in the world that are not very functional 
for the human beings for whom they're supposed to serve, and having that frame of service systems makes that difference. Now we have actually a, a large body of research into, um, uh, into service systems. Um, I have to say that um, I am somewhat dismayed, and I regularly express this, because um, the popular literature, the, the big people that you'll hear if you go to the service science literature are Vargo and Lush. Great guys. I've actually met Vargo now. Um, uh, Jim Kojima invited him to Tokyo, and so I actually got to meet the guy. And, um, and uh, Steve Vargo said that when you're in a new domain, there's two ways to approach the domain. <laughs> One is to make up new words because you don't want people confused. And the other is to use the same words, overload them again. So everyone has their own dictionary and they think they know what that means. Um, and sometimes that's helpful. So uh, he said that the Vargo and Lush approach to service systems does the latter. They use the word service they have to redefine things all the time. Um, in the history of this society, um, part of the, uh, the people that have come up uh, and have worked on service systems, uh, and I'm glad to announce that uh, Rafael Ramirez um, will be um, a keynote speaker at, um, in, at San Jose. Uh, and he had done work with Richard Norman on service systems um, going back quite a ways. Um, to give the lineage, Raphael is a graduate of the Social System Science Program at the University of Pennsylvania, which was a cost program. So if we start looking deeper into how systems and service systems fit together, uh, there is, we have to go back into ACOF and we can start talking about uh, co-production. So for those of you who are not familiar with this work, I've summarized it on the web page and you can come and take a look at it. But the idea of co-producers are two or more objects, properties, or environments that are producer of the same thing. Now, there's a very technical definition to this, um, but the, the part that's valuable about, about this is when people think about supply chain as an example, they think very linearly. And so they think about people bringing everything and then we have the result. Uh, the typical parable that's told about this, and Wes Churchman had written about this in Experience Reflection, and it goes way back, is about, um, about creating an oak, an oak tree. So I want to produce an oak tree. How does I do that? Okay. Um, I'll give you an acorn, I'll give you water, I'll give you soil. Is that necessary and sufficient to create an oak tree? Oh, you forgot about the air, you forgot about the nutrients, is that sufficient? Well, not quite. The, the, the issue we have now is actually a fundamental systems issue, which is only God creates trees. It's an emergent property from all those things. The way that we've looked at service systems, if we look in a supply chain point of view, doesn't have that idea of co-production. You bring things together, and the output and the outcome emerge from those things coming together. In the definitions, um, there are, uh, if you read ACOF, there's a strong definition for um, uh, co-production. Uh, my friend David Hawk makes uh, fun of uh, Russell ACOF because on purposeful system he defines love. And so you can go look for love and, uh, and uh, find his definition. It is a definition, not the definition. Um, and there's also this, uh, a description about outcome. Uh, outcome is interesting, um, an interesting phrase because we need, we need to differentiate a little bit between outputs, outcomes, and impacts. And th this is where we start getting into some of the stuff that was done by Norman Ramirez and was carried through uh, Ramirez and Bolin. Um, when we start talking about co-production and, uh, and the idea of co-producing with the customer. So, in the old days, when we think about uh, supply chain, you deliver the product to the customer, we're thinking about something a little bit different, which is co-producing an outcome. It is not the customer as a recipient, the customer is a co-producer. How is value co-produced from the point of view of the customer? Uh, we need to shift our attention um, towards the interaction. And so in the systems community, we're comfortable with that idea of interactions, 
the oak tree that emerges from the parts. But the people who are currently doing the service systems research aren't there. And I think they could use our help. IBM has had an initiative uh, called Smarter Planet, um, which is an interesting idea where they've talked about these three things, how the world has changed. And this is the world of the internet we have today. And the, the mantra, as I say, that every IBM is supposed to learn is instrumented, interconnected, and intelligent. So what does that mean? Um, the world is becoming instrumented um, the sort of thing that we, uh, we have with um, becoming instrumented, we have transistor technology embedded in mobile phones of 4 billion mobile subscribers, and there are 30 million RFID tags that are out there. So things that before would not respond because uh, you couldn't measure them, all of a sudden are now instrument. You can see things you couldn't see before. In the world becoming interconnected, uh, the internet is not only a means for two billion people to be connected person to person, but also uh, allows for the instruments or devices to be connected machine to machine. So a lot of us tend to think about the internet in terms of the human being to the machine, but that's nothing compared to the machine to machine. So those of you who are into the technology and hear about IP version 6 coming out, IP version 4 had a number of addresses and they didn't think about, oh, well, your shirt could have a tag in it that's going to need an IP address. And so uh, that, that's why we're now moving to IPv6. On the last category, things are becoming more intelligent. <laughs> Since instrumented devices generate data that can be stored and analyzed, you have the advanced analytics enabling intelligence that can be translated into action in near real time. One of the big mind shifts, and this is where science starts changing, is traditionally in science, we have paused and we go out, we gather data, and we bring it back and we analyze it. In the world of the internet, we really can't do that anymore. Can you imagine Google stopping to index the internet? It can't do that, it moves too quickly. So we need to get to thinking about how is it that we can process data in real time? Now, when I see these sorts of things from IBM, since these things, uh, some of the strategy guys are really smart, but then you have the marketing guys on top of it. I try to figure out, well, what is going on here? And, and how should we think about this? So I thought, well, let's do a left hand, right hand thing about this. Because this is the right hand. Um, what would the left hand be? Uh, so this right hand is about uh, converging physical, physical and digital infrastructure. Things before that were physical are now digital. A telephone before that you couldn't track now has a chip in it so that it knows where it is. It's both digital and physical. So let's think about how the world has changed from the pre-digital physical infrastructure. So before, before we had instrumented, we'd think about the world as being invisible or unobserved. <laughs> we would have, as opposed to being interconnected, we have these analog or synchronous connections, and that's person to person, machine to machine. It wasn't that long ago before the internet that we didn't have anything connected at all. And thirdly, on this idea of intelligent, we had things as dumb or unresponsive to interaction. Uh, so uh, your mobile phone is gradually becoming more intelligent because sending some of the data back and forth over the, um, your telephone network is just inefficient, right? So they store more and more, they do more programming on your mobile phone. But your phone used to be, the first mobile phones were dumb phones. And so now we have the intelligence. So those are ideas about <laughs> service systems. Let me now turn to natural systems. Um, it's been pointed out to me that um, I have a biased view of natural systems. This is, not, this is not a rigorous definition of natural systems, which include uh, physics. Um, but I am focused primarily on ecosystems. And the three areas where I see a lot of promising work um, are firstly in the resilience community. Um, for those of you who are not familiar with it, and um, Mary knows this stuff because you heard some of it in her, uh, her talk before, uh, I'll give a little bit of uh, information on cross-scale relations and panarchy. And uh, the third idea of regime shifts and thresholds, um, another person that, uh, that I'm announcing as a speaker 
for, uh, for San Jose next year is Gary Peterson, who is part of the Resilience Alliance and has been leading the Regime Shifts Project with uh, the Resilience uh, Alliance. And he's from the Stockholm School, uh, Stockholm um, Resilience Center. Um, so, for those of you who are not familiar with these diagrams, I'm, I am not going to describe them in great detail. This is your homework. Between now and next year, you should know what these diagrams mean. This is uh, Gunderson and Hauling. Uh, the, the first one is the adaptive loop, uh, where we have, um, uh, the, where we have, uh, where it's going through phases. And uh, it's actually tricky, um, assigning this to students, um, and understanding that the adaptive loop is depicted in two dimensions of, um, in two dimensions of the, uh, of the potential, which is roughly the wealth of the system, um, and the controllability of the system, which is a connectedness. And they have the third dimension, which is the adaptive capacity, which is resilience. And so it takes you a little while to figure out that on the left side of the screen, you're looking at a three-dimensional object in two dimensions, and when you rotate it, then you see the resilience. Resilience is good and bad, and where we can apply this in, for example, service systems, is when we're looking at organizational change, as an example, it's hard to change an organization that is resilient. Now, that doesn't mean it's a functional organization. You can have a resilient, dysfunctional organization. So how is it that you want to destabilize that? You actually want to get it to a, a, a place of low resilience so you can make that change. In nature, we may have to wait for it. In human systems, we may be able to influence that. Thinking about this in terms of cross-scale relations and panarchy, Things don't operate all at the same scale, so we have some things that are big, some things that are small, and we're talking about both temporal and physical uh, scales. But in the systems community, we need to think about how things work cross-scale and how they link with each other. How the individual links to the society through all the different sorts of organizations that we have, as an example. And that is uh, what is in the panic literature. And we have what are called regime shifts and thresholds. Um, I was amused at this uh, because these are, uh, for people who are not familiar with it, the ecologists call them uh, uh, ball and cup diagrams. And uh, the, one of the ideas that comes out of, uh, of the resilience research is the idea that there are multiple stable states. And so it's possible to come out of one stable state into another one. So uh, in this example, uh, we start off on the left with, um, with clear water lakes. And uh, you have a, uh, a stable state, but then you could have the phosphorus coming into that with agricultural runoff uh, in the second one. And the third one, it causes it to come over into a, what's at the right, a, another stable state, which is um, turbid water. This may or may not be the state you're, you want to be in. Uh, one of the things I learned was at the Resilience Conference, uh, well, you know, why do ecologists like studying lakes? It's an interesting uh, thing that we social scientists can appreciate because there's a lot of them. And they're almost all identical or they're next to each other. And so you can look at one lake and say, this one is in this stable state and the one that's half a mile over is in another stable state. Well, why is that? And so the idea about having these thresholds, um, how shallow is that cup? Um, can we know that we are going to go and have another stable state and shift to a stable state that's less desirable? This is research that's going on right now within the uh, uh, ecosystem ecology movement, uh, ecology researchers, and um, service system people have no idea. Uh, they don't think about these sorts of things. There's an opportunity to learn. I'm going to shift now to some frames, more homework. Uh, that you may think about for next year. Um, and some of you may know some of this. Um, one of the things I've discovered is that the young people appear to know uh, little of this. And so I'll repeat things that some people should think about. So I'll go over these rather quickly um, and, uh, and give you some descriptions on these. So the first, um, which uh, 
is a large body of work from the Tavistock Institute. Uh, I'm going to be visiting on Monday uh, in, uh, in London. Is the uh, legacy of socio uh, socio-psychological, socio-technical, socio and socio-ecological systems. And um, these were created. These, these started in uh, post World War II at the Tavistock Institute. Uh, they emerged from each other in relation to changes taking place in the wider social environment. They didn't forecast that one was going to come from each other, and although people tend to focus on one as opposed to the other two, uh, if you read the original Tristan Murray, they say that they're interdependent and each has its own focus. The um, socio-psychological came out from, uh, uh, from people coming back from the war, soldiers coming back to the war, and uh, the, the Tavistock Institute can be contrasted to the work they've done in the Tavistock Clinic. Because in the institute projects, uh, the psychological forces are directed towards the social field, whereas in the clinic, it's the other way around. So there's a slight different orientation there. Socio-technical systems perspective was something that was new. It came out of the mining studies. Um, it was a new paradigm based on discovering the best match between the social and technical systems of the organization. Uh, I have to admit that although I knew about social technical systems, I've only been recently reading more, and there is design principle one and design principle two. And I have to say I'm ashamed of myself that I am not familiar with DP1 and DP2 are, and I should be. So I'm doing my own reading in my own homework. Thirdly, there is a socio-ecological uh, uh, socio systems perspective, and this has to do with how the system operates in its environment. Um, for the, we may have a tutorial next year, I hope, on uh, turbulent environments. If you are working in a turbulent environment where you can't, where the outside of the world is changing so much faster than the inside, you need to take a different approach to the world. Secondly, I have a spectrum here, collapse, resilience, sustainability, regeneration. Again, I get to learn from my students and being challenged how to teach this because when we talk about the sustainability movement, the question is, well, what do you mean by sustainability? And so uh, collapse. Um, collapse is a, it, it's helpful to understand collapse in the work of Joe Tainter and Tim Allen, former ISIS president, in understanding that collapse is uh, a rapid significant loss of established set, a level of social political complexity. Um, Joe Tainter studied uh, why Rome fell, and, and that's the idea behind it. And that's a good place to start. In teaching students sustainability, because I wasn't up the curve myself, I said, let's start here. Let's talk about sustainability as not collapsing. We're going to do away with all those values about we should do this, we should do that. If you like the system that is operating today, and if we talk about the, uh, the um, regime shifts that are happening, if you like the regime you're in today and you don't want it to collapse, then that, that is one state, keeping it in that regime. We can go up to the next level of, of resilience. Now, resilience actually has two definitions. Um, one is an uh, engineering definition, and the other is an ecological definition. The engineering definition of resilience really assumes that there is one stable state. So it focuses on efficiency, constancy, and predictability, which are all attributes to the core of engineers' desire for fail-safe designs. The second one assumes that there are multiple stable states possible, and so focuses on persistence, change, unpredictability, and these are attributes embraced and celebrated by biologists in an evolutionary perspective and those who search for fail, safe fail designs. And so the first, we talk about engineering. Engineering really does recognize there are things such as brittle designs. But when we talk about resilience, you should now have the question about, well, what do you mean by resilience? For sustainability, I'm going to um, uh, punt a little bit and, uh, and quote... Um, uh, uh, Alan Tainter and, and uh, Hoxtra. Um, and the most helpful thing that I found in teaching this is when confronted with the term sustainability, one should always ask, of what, for whom, for how long, and at what cost? And keeping those in mind, 
uh, we, we end up having a social discussion because the of what, for whom, looms large. The last one I'd like to think about, um, learning more from my students, architecture students, uh, they pointed me at some work on uh, regeneration. Uh, and in particular, um, I was uh, led to the work of David Orr, and so uh, a few weeks ago, uh, I had the opportunity to go visit Oberlin College, uh, where one of the top ten uh, green buildings in the United States is. And so, um, in, in, learning about, uh, the, uh, in learning about the way that they designed uh, that center at Oberlin College, uh, there were two principal people working on that and, uh, and advising on that. First is William McDonough, who many of you may know from the Cradle to Cradle work as the architect. But I actually got much more interested in the work of John Tillman Lyle, who was a landscape architect. And, uh, and the idea here is about regenerative design. Because if we think about sustainability, it, as sustain, sustainability really means a zero point. So you're going to have some things that are not sustainable within your system, which means there's going to have to be other things within your system that regenerate. So think about things that die, you're going to need some things that are born, right? Um, and, uh, and so I have started doing research and thinking about regeneration. If I take this over to the world of service systems, a lot of the services that I've worked in, I've worked as a consultant, uh, we don't regenerate the knowledge. And so there's an opportunity for them to think about sustainable <coughs> human capital, as an example, uh, and where regeneration plays there. Complicatedness, complexity, and gain. Uh, for those of you who are still confused by Tim Allen's talks, uh, because many of us are, uh, I, I give this actually, this is interesting, in Finland, I sign it to students and I say, you will read this content because you will find it valuable. You probably won't understand it the first time you read it. And, but there may come a time when you go, I think I know something about this. I may have to go back and read this. And so this is the reason that I've included Tim uh, as a plenary speaker, um, maybe as a remedial speaker, uh, helping us learn again, um, the idea of complexity and complicatedness. Complexity and complicated is, I met Tim actually for the first time in 1998, uh, and he published this in, in, uh, in 2003 uh, in the book, and so it helped me a lot to understand the difference between complex, complicatedness and complexity. Complicatedness means taking things apart, uh, uh, means organizing at a lower level of energy. Um, the advantage of complexity is it's more efficient, but when you have complexity, uh, the greater efficiency comes at the risk of less sustainability. So we end up with these design choices between complicated designs and complex designs. And I'll definitely leave the high gain and low gain discussion for, uh, for Tim, or you can uh, mob him and get an explanation while he's still here and uh, not let him get on his train. Dialogue, language, action, and conversation. From the work of Bella Banathy, we have the idea of generative dialogue, which is to create a collective worldview, and strategic dialogue that focuses on the specific issues and tasks on specific situations that we're in. So people often skip this, uh, this, I this uh, idea of generative conversation and move to strategic dialogues. Uh, this is something that uh, the uh, IFSR has had a long heritage, uh, the ISI has had a long heritage in these sorts of conversations. And, uh, and we've, we've heard a little bit about the uh, situations when uh, uh, people are still trying to bond. Uh, we're have that discussion. Uh, I'd like to add on to that um, the work of, um, of uh, Fernando Flores um, in language action perspective. Uh, this comes in uh, commitments. And uh, the, the, uh, the book, uh, Creating Computers and Cognitions, is actually one of the uh, better known books of computer science which no one understands. Everyone has it on their, on their uh, shelf and they don't understand. But the idea of commitment is more or less like buying and selling a house um, and, uh, and operating through that. And uh, commitment is one of the uh, four types of conversation. You can have a conversation for action, when you actually commit to do something. You can have a conversation for clarification, which is, oh, the world is a different way, from, uh, happening differently than we expected, so we need to clarify what this is going on. 
uh, the conversation for possibilities, where we're looking for new futures, and the conversation for orientation, which are very much the bonding, generative conversation sort of thing, understand where people come from. But understanding these types of conversations, it helps people sometimes frame the way that we need to move forward. Sometimes you need a generative conversation, sometimes you need a strategic conversation, sometimes they're about possibilities, sometimes they're about clarification. We haven't actually had discussions, um, and I haven't had any speakers on this, for people who like to do this research. There's been a lot of work recently on power laws and scale-free networks, particularly around social, around, uh, social media. And so traditionally we've thought about a lot of things as bell curves, normal distribution and things like that. And uh, uh, as an example, we could think about um, the highway network um, in the United States and how all those things live together and, and uh, how they're distributed. Uh, but there's new research uh, that's primarily on the power law distribution, and so we now think about nodes not as all equal. So for those of you who read the tipping point, you have the people who are connectors, then, and, uh, and they naturally do that, and then you have um, the long tail distribution that comes along. Uh, we haven't had any, I haven't seen any papers on this um, in, the, in, in our work, if you know people who are doing research in these areas and you would like to bring them to the conference, please do, because they could educate us. Communities of practice and world disclosing. Um, this has been interesting. Some of the people in the social sciences and people that have worked in knowledge management have generally been familiar with the idea of communities of practice. It's come up as part of the vocabulary, but part that, uh, that we haven't really captured is the practice term that has happened in philosophy. So uh, when we've had discussions about epistemology, we've had discussions about ontology, uh, one of the perspectives I think that we've missed is the practice perspective. And a lot of that is based off uh, phenomenology. You encounter a situation, what is your predisposition to behave? And so, in the work that uh, Wenger had done um, uh, when he was um, uh, at Xerox in the, uh, the uh, Institute for, uh, for Learning, uh, you, you end up with all the things that are associated with that. Uh, you end up with the community that happens around learning, the identity of the people, the meaning, and the practice that happens from it. And this is something that uh, is relatively recent. Um, we're talking about a, a book that's uh, 1998, I believe. And so uh, the systems movement has really not had this perspective. Um, I had seen some work uh, by uh, uh, Wojciech Gasparski uh, on praxeology. Uh, Gary is working his way through an um, edited volume by Gasparski and uh, Bella Banathy um, because all of a sudden we discovered, oh, they actually did this work on praxeology. And um, I, I hope that within the systems movement that we reignite some of those. Um, Maybe uh, uh, if we have uh, friends here from, uh, from Poland, we could get them to uh, work on the Polish philosophers and help us out a little bit more on that. Finally, I want to talk about this last category, uh, which I call uh, open standards, open source, and reference models. And this is actually getting close to being practice-based. And uh, if we stay on our ivory towers in the systems movement, we sometimes don't see what's happening in front of us. So here's one of the examples. Uh, one of the reasons, and I'm trying to explain why I ended up over in Ecosi in the first place. Uh, there is this new language called SysML, System Modeling Language. The systems engineers looked at what was done, being done by information technology people who created this unified modeling language, and they said, we should have system modeling language. And what they did was there are 14 concepts in uh, UML, and they said, actually, these people in information systems are pretty smart, so we're going to borrow eight of them and use them exactly the same way. The other ones we're going to redefine in a different way. So if you think about, um, about a mobile phone, if you are designing the software in a mobile phone, you tend to use UML. What they are trying to do in the systems engineering community is say, for the mobile phone device, you should model that in SysML. Because if everyone has a different language, you know, we have all this overhead, it doesn't help. So uh, the way they've done this, they've worked within a standards organization, open standards organization, and then negotiated SysML. The reason that I, I got interested in this um, is that there are, are tools supporting this, 
Uh, some are free, some you have to buy. But you can do models in SysML. Now, uh, part of the exploration on this, uh, I appreciate I'm more technical than most of the people, so uh, we had Gary go to the SysML class. And the question that we're asking is, could you use this modeling language to model social systems? And it's an open question, but Gary didn't say, said that there's nothing he's seen that would preclude us from doing that so far. So here's an opportunity for people who are modeling social systems, modeling service systems as an example. Um, you might want to look into SysML. Uh, now David Greenwood actually said SysML in his talk, so he knows what it is. Um, if you want to gather around him, maybe you can, you can point to some people some more references. But the idea is, be, this is part of the reason for reuniting science and engineering. The engineers are using this. They are using SysML on hard systems. There may be an opportunity to use it on soft systems if we talk to them. There are methods available. Now, another feature of this is that um, within, again, information systems, the Eclipse Foundation has methods um, in what's called open unified process. So if you were going to deliver an information system, they have these methods, plus they have tools that are free. You go to the website and you download it and you could design this. So for those of you in consulting, perhaps in the consulting workshop, um, I, I described the interesting way I discovered this. So uh, in the 1990s, IBM had IBM Global Services Method, which was proprietary and no one could even see it. Like, we had to sign for the manuals. And it wasn't updated very much and then I wondered what happened to it. And then I was looking around and lo and behold, it is now open source and it is free and it not only doesn't come in a binder, it comes in a software tool. If you were designing a consulting engagement that is large, you could define the work products of those people. You could define the roles, the tasks, how all those things interact. You could export it into project, uh, Microsoft Project if you want. The tool is free. Why is everybody using this? Just don't know. So the, these, there, there are tools available and uh, opportunities to, to use those. And when we talk about systems, Information systems people understand systems. They don't understand all systems, but these are systems. We just make that extra step. In, a, in the government of Canada, we have program and service models for government. These are when we start getting the frameworks. And so as opposed to reinventing all of these ideas, we can use open frameworks to describe the world. So here's an example uh, that is well-defined. Programs, services, processes, resources in the Canadian government. They do it at the federal, they do it at the provincial, and they're trying to do this at the municipal level. So what's the difference between a program and a service? Well, if you are in the higher level of the government, programs require the assent of parliament. Services don't. Nice definitions. If you, don't, if you haven't got that level of, uh, of uh, understanding of the definitions, then you could borrow from that from reference points. So just to close, how can the ISSF be structured to encourage learning? Chet West Churchman said, the system approach begins when you first see the world through the eyes of others. The way we can do that is through an inquiring system. So um, for those of you who are familiar with uh, the systems applications and uh, business industry SIG, uh, that was designed as a Singarian inquiring system. Uh, I claimed it seems to work for 20 people. I'm dismayed. Or I now, I'll leave it to Louie to work out whether it actually works for 40 people. I've never had that many people, so it's a challenge, and we have to design a different system. But the intent with San Jose 2012 was to design this as an inquiring system. Uh, I'll leave you with more homework. Uh, there are five types of inquiring systems. There is the inductive consensual inquiring system. If we all agree the world is flat, the world is flat. There is the analytic deductive system, which is like a scorecard, which you add up. These are both objective forms of knowledge. We have the multiple realities inquiring system, uh, which says the model data can't be separated, which is uh, related to the Kantian view of the world. And we have the fourth way of doing it, dialectic, where you have people in taking different positions to have the opposition so that you can have discussions. In a dialectic, we would have one person, as an example, saying black, the other person says white, the person that learns is neither one of those people. It is the observer. The observer can see the shades of gray while other people are taking those positions of black or white. 
That is why I have asked for a program that's oriented around service systems and natural systems. What we're going to do is have service systems people listening to natural system speakers and saying, I don't know what to do with that. I really don't know what to do with that. And working through and trying to create new knowledge through those gray areas. And we'll do that in a multiple perspectives inquiry where everyone gets the opportunity to be both an observer and one of those people in, uh, 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 that's acting as a debater. With that, I welcome you to, uh, to uh, come to the uh, ISSS San Jose 2012 meeting a year from now. Uh, we will be starting uh, paper, uh, accepting um, abstracts in December and starting registration in January, and I hope to see you all there.